In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, well, thank you guys for the prayers. I want to let you know Sam seems to be feeling a little better, uh, a little more himself. So I'm hoping for the best, and he's still taking medicine for a little while. Um, but he's up and around and, and feeling a lot better. So I want to thank you guys for your prayers. Um, also, you can see that I've done a little uh, rearranging here. Um, this was <laughs> kind of the last room to put together and uh, I kind of threw it together to have it kind of neat, but I, I did eventually, want, I do want to make it a library, um, a study, an office, um, and a chapel. And so I'm on my way to doing that. Um, the other change is I, I got a mic, okay? So I did, had a mic that I used to use for recording. And um, so there were some comments about not being able to hear the audio, and I've uh, figured out a way to, um, to hook up this mic, which is a, a very nice mic. Like I say, I had it for recording years ago. Um, it's a studio mic. So I, I figured out a way uh, with the help of the guy at, at uh, Best Buy to um, hook it up to my phone. And eventually, hopefully, I'm gonna be able you know, to hook it up to a laptop and, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, I'm not really into the, how do I say, you know, the professional videos and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's more about, for me, it's more about teaching and just getting the message out. Um, so the, you know, all the fancy stuff is not really my kind of thing. Um, I have been talking to someone about possibly starting a podcast, but, uh, to be honest, the way the world is going, I don't know that we'll have time to do that. Um, other than that, everything's going good. I've been really busy. I started another job, so thanks for the prayers for that. Um, I'm enjoying it, and it's it's a lot. Uh, how would I say? Um, a lot less stressful. Um, really good uh, group of guys, and um, you know I'm enjoying it so far. So we'll see how that goes. <clears throat> so uh, anyway, I was going to do this video. I wanted to do this video on the allegorical sense of scripture. And it's one of the senses of reading scripture, and I'm not going to go through the whole Bible, but I think it's important for Catholics to understand um, that there are different senses of reading scripture. And I would refer you uh, to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Uh, it's going to be page 33, starting at number 115. It just goes through the different senses of reading scripture. Um, I would also say that one has to be careful with the allegorical sense of scripture that you don't get trapped in reading all of scripture that way um it's okay to meditate on it's okay to um to pray with um but you don't want to you don't want just to read all of scripture in the allegorical sense and that's it you want to add in uh you know the moral sense the uh the anagogical sense and um you know there there needs to be a there's a balance there that has to happen <clears throat> you don't want to see everything as an allegory, in other words. Um, but the, some of the deeper things are revealed in the allegorical sense of Scripture, the deeper mysteries, um, especially as they pertain to Christ and the church. And within some of them, they're even prophetic and um, point beyond themselves. And this is one of the things that I find so powerful about the allegorical sense of Scripture is that... Um, Basically, what you have is a historical record um, written down by the person or by a person who knew the person. So let's say, um, uh, let's say the first five books of the Bible, okay, the the Torah or the Pentateuch, okay. So um, most people, you know, read it and understand it as written by Moses, okay. But there are scholars within the church that believe that some of the first five books of Moses were written by Moses and someone else. And this because there's varying uh, words used in uh, different meanings, a different type of writing. Um, so this, again, this is what I find so profound about it. I'm going to try to articulate it, but it's hard to articulate. Basically, it would it's like Moses wrote down portions of his life. And he chose now. He chose under the inspiration of the Spirit to write down which ones were important. And now, if you have another author that knew Moses, or you know maybe a, a second or third generation, 
again, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, wrote down other portions of Moses' life. Okay, so that's what we have. And the whole thing with, you know, going all the way back to Genesis and then through the, uh, you know, uh, Elijah and then Moses and the Exodus and, you know, all of that. So that's all, it's all recorded history, but all inspired and written um, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't have the daily events, like every single day of, in detail of Moses' life. And so what these authors wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit um, is profound in the sense that it's very, there's a possibility that the, that the person or the other persons who wrote the first five books of Moses, besides Moses himself, never personally knew Moses. So they were writing down what they heard, kind of the same way the Gospels were. <clears throat> I'm sorry, the way the same way that the four gospel accounts were written. They were more of what they heard and then they were written down. Um, but what's so profound about this is that within the historical event themselves, um, they can be seen when allegorical or even prophetic in the sense that very often the uh, historical event that's been recorded in Scripture within the Old Testament points beyond itself to something that either was fulfilled in Jesus or that it has been fulfilled in the church or is yet to be fulfilled in the church. And so there's there's kind of a um, a kind of rolling aspect to it, okay? It kind of folds over onto itself. Um, but again, I, would, I want to say that I would caution, okay? You don't want to read scripture only in the allegorical sense. Um, you want to go, you know, well, let me read this, what the, what the catechism says here. Um, and this is uh, 115, page 33, the senses of Scripture. It says, according to ancient tradition, one can distinguish between two senses of Scripture, the literal and the spiritual, the latter being subdivided into the allegorical, the moral, the moral and anagogical senses. The profound concordance of the four senses guarantees all its riches to the living reading of scripture in the church. Okay, so you go with the literal sense, the spiritual sense, the allegorical sense, the moral sense, and the antagogical sense. Okay, so anyway, read that with that about what that says in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Again, it's really important. But the, the allegorical sense of scripture I find fascinating. And one of the reasons, again, is because you have people very often... Uh, that never knew the people that actually went through what they went through, but yet under the influence of the Holy Spirit wrote down what they wrote down. And everything they wrote down can become uh, a prophetic allegory and point to something beyond itself. And so I think it's important um, in the sense that a lot of times, um, in a lot of cases, um, it can point for things, uh, point to things, okay, or certain signs or symbols within it that point beyond themselves again to um, prophetic events in the regarding the future of the church that the clergy especially are called to watch for. And so a lot of times these signs are, are unveiled. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to give just a couple of examples off the top of my head. And um, and we're, I just kind of have fun with it. And again, um, this isn't... Uh, how do I say, um, you know, I'm not speaking in any position of authority or anything like that. There are some, you know, like I say, there's things that I see and that's just kind of what I'm sharing with you. Um, but, uh, the allegorical sense of scriptures is, is a powerful thing. Um, especially to meditate on in prayer or to read prayerfully. Um, I've said before that, uh, scripture should always be thought of in, in in terms of depth rather than length okay so the rather than going from the book of genesis to the book of revelation the length and how much you have to read there are layers and veils that you know can get peeled away through prayer through contemplation um and in you know in one of these in in really kind of reveals different senses so one of the senses being the allegorical and then you begin to see deeper meanings within it so uh, the first one, I think I pointed out before, and it was just really kind of the story of Moses, okay? Uh, Moses was called by God to deliver Israel from the bondage and, and slavery of, uh, of Egypt, okay? In the same way, that kind of points to Christ that we have been, um, he has led us and set us free, okay? The true Israel, 
um, from the bondage and slavery of sin, of sin, okay? And Moses actually prophesies about this. He says, a prophet like me will the Lord God raise up for you um, from among your own kin. It is to him you shall listen, okay? And uh, so we see Moses deliver them. They go through the desert. We see the manna, the bread from heaven, um, and Jesus with the Eucharist, okay? That's another allegory, another sign that points towards something in Moses' this time that had yet to take place, but was it fulfilled? with the institution of the Eucharist. And so we have all those teachings on the Eucharist in the Gospel of John. Um, coming to the Red Sea uh, represents um, baptism as taught by Peter, the sacrament of baptism, he, or I'm sorry, that was Noah. So even Peter saw the allegory of Noah, okay, the floodwaters, this prefigured baptism which saves you now, okay. Um, but the crossing of the Red Sea, it can be seen as the deliverance of, of Israel when all seems lost, you know. And so, again, when you, and I've done this before, I don't do it often, but I've kind of laid allegorical scripture um, uh, next to the New Testament as fulfilled in, D, in Jesus and then with the teachings of the church. And then on top of that, you know, if you add in or kind of look at certain um, Marian apparitions and messages um, that are approved by the church from certain angles, they actually kind of mirror each other. You know, um, I, I, our, I think it was Our Lady of Good Success that, that had said, when all seems lost, she would intervene, okay? Um, so Moses at Sinai, <clears throat> excuse me, that's a, that's a big one because you, you have them, the Israelites uh, wash their clothes okay and and purify themselves and and so they're wearing white it's a sign of purity it really points to um the feast of divine mercy and and easter okay where they were wear white robes and then on the third day um they were to meet god in the exodus and so we see um god descend on sinai in the third day on the third day in in a consuming fire and so what you have is the camp of the Israelites, you have the mountain of Sinai and God consuming, or God coming down in a consuming fire, right? In the book of Revelation, that it's again, it's allegorical because when you look at the book of Revelation, some of the final chapters there, um, what you have is um, Gog and Magog surrounding the beloved city, which is Jerusalem, which Paul says corresponds to Sinai or Sinai corresponds to Jerusalem okay surrounding the beloved city and the camp of the holy ones and that's the it, it points back to Sinai where they set up a camp just on at the base of the mountain and what you see in in um, in the exodus that God comes down in a consuming fire in the same way that's what happens in the book of Revelation God comes down can fire comes down from heaven and consumes Gog and Magog um, Joshua, the warrior, and and uh, this is kind of cool, the crossing of the Jordan River. So there weren't only two bodies of water that were crossed in the ex or I think it was the Jordan. Um, I'll have to look again. Um, but the two bodies of water that were crossed, right? So they crossed the, the Red Sea and then they crossed the other one into the Promised Land. And the, the really the amazing thing about this that I saw um, that kind of jumped out at me recently was it was the priests who were holding up or elevating the ark okay holding up the ark and um that crossed this this river which stopped flowing completely and they crossed again on on dry ground while the priest stood in the middle and and held up the ark but again this again this jumped out to me um just recently you know i was thinking about it and our lady has said that the priests who venerate me the priests who hold me up who honor me will be persecuted but do you realize at the end, when the, when the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary comes about, the, it will be the very priests that are holding up and honoring Mary, okay? Holding her up, the new ark, if you will, um, that will that will allow and lead the, pe the people of God into a new um, period of time, into a new epoch, into a period of peace, or into... Um, the promised land, if you will. Okay, so there's an allegory there when it's kind of lined up with um, authentic um, private revelation and Marian apparition within the church. Um, another one that jumped out, and again, I'm just going, kind of wrote them down off the top of my head, the Maccabees. Okay, the, the two books of the Maccabees is really um, deals with uh, the Persian king Antiochus Epiphanes 
um, you know, it's kind of uh, overlaid, if you will, or intertwined with the book of Daniel. But what you see happen with the Maccabees is really, really is allegorical to the last three and a half years of a seven year tribulation and the reign of an antichrist. And that's why Antiochus kind of becomes a prefigurement of that, you know, desecrated the temple. Um, uh, he persecuted the Jews horribly, um, you know, did away with the religion, did away with the daily sacrifice, he, all of this stuff he did. And so he becomes a prefigurement of, you know, what is written, really written in the book of Daniel, um, prophetically concerning the end times. And so we see, we see an allegory there as well. Um, Queen Esther, uh, interceding for God's people. And, and that's, that's kind of an easy one. Some of them are easy to spot. But if you go through the story, um, Queen Esther interceded. She was the primary intercessor to the king for God's people and, and you know, won him over and, and uh, everything worked out well. Um, in the book of Jeremiah, we see Jeremiah, he, uh, when there's the invasion, he flees to the hill country to hide the ark. And I don't know, I, I, well, I won't say I don't know. I, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. I don't know if St. Luke knew this when he wrote his gospel account, but do you know it mirrors what happened with Jeremiah when Mary flees to the hill country. And, um, you know, she's, she's with child and um, she goes to the hill country to see her cousin Elizabeth. But in both cases, we have the ark going to the hill country in the Old Testament in the prophet Jeremiah. And then in the gospel account of Luke, we have the new ark who is Mary um, fleeing also into the hill country or, you know, um, going into the hill country. And so they kind of mirror one another. And like I say, it's an amazing thing because, you know, if it, if it was the prophet Jeremiah that wrote that down, okay, then he wrote down what he did and why he did it, okay? without probably without ever knowing that that would become an allegory to something that St. Luke would also write down concerning Mary under the under the inspiration of the spirit and so we see this bouncing back and forth but a lot of the signs can be seen within scripture um, in the Old Testament that are actually fulfilled in the new um, nine times out of ten in people okay and so again it's just an amazing thing to to read scripture in that sense um, it's it's profound and it reveals things, um, as I say, concerning the church and, and the future of the world. Okay. Uh, Joseph, I think I pointed this one out before. Um, Joseph's entire life, all the highlights of his life, really mirror the relationship with, um, with God and Israel, okay, the Jews. And so you see, um, you see that he was his, uh, he, Joseph, Joseph was beloved by his father. Uh, he was betrayed by his own brothers. Uh, he was thrown in a pit, left for dead, um, delivered from the pit. He was sold into slavery, um, kind of in the same way that Jesus was sold for, uh, you know, 70 pieces of silver. And, um, you know, took upon our, took our sin upon himself, our, so he delivered us from the slavery of sin, right? But he took all that upon himself. And so we see that in the kind of mirroring each other, allegorical in that sense. Um, eventually Joseph was given sovereignty over the entire kingdom, okay? Which Jesus has been given kingship overall. And um, then finally confronted with his brothers, he forgave them and then actually even provided for them so they wouldn't die. And we know that the Jews have to be converted before, um, the, you know, the second coming. And they will eventually come into the Catholic Church and they will be given the food that leads to eternal life. They will be given the Eucharist that saves them, that saves their life. And so, again, we see uh, in the allegorical sense of their uh, scripture there. Um One that's really powerful to me that I want to point out, and it's not so much an allegory as it is a fulfillment of the law, and that is the Day of Atonement. Okay, so according to Jewish law, and I know, I know some of the details of it, but not all of it. I haven't studied it in a long time, but basically what they did was they had two goats, and they would cast lots, and one goat was sacrificed, right, for the sins of the people, 
and then the other goat was um, uh, basically the sins of the people were put on that goat. He was led out into the wilderness and thrown over a cliff. Okay, given to Azazel. Azazel, uh, incidentally, is a name for the demon. Um, it appears in the book of Enoch, and it also appears, or a variation of it appears in um, in uh, the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. But the fulfillment of that of that of those sacrifices okay what happened there was fulfilled absolutely perfectly in the person of jesus and in the person of judas and so the the uh what they called the scapegoat okay was taken out into the wilderness it was led out into the wilderness and it was thrown over a cliff and the other goat was was slaughtered okay and so this you see this exact same thing happen with jesus and judas Jesus was sacrificed. He was slaughtered, okay, for the sins of the world. Jesus, Judas was led out into the desert where we have one account where he hung himself and the other one where it says, it, you know, it, he threw himself off a cliff. Personally, I believe it was both. I think he probably hung himself over a branch that was overhanging a cliff and the thing broke and he fell. And so, you know, kind of splattered out that way. But... Um, we see that feast absolutely fulfilled in the person of Jesus. Um, another one that I would point out comes, I believe, in the Acts of the Apostles. And it's when Paul is on this ship. And um, when you pull out certain words that they kind of jump out, again, it can be seen as an allegory. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with looking at it that way. Um, but Paul, Paul's on this ship, and then there's a nor'easter that comes up. That means a storm from the north and the east. So you have Paul who represents um, the priesthood, okay, the bishops, the clergy, on a boat, which would represent the church, and a storm comes from the north and the east. And this is really kind of um, intriguing to me anyway, because when you study the Old Testament prophets, you'll, you'll notice that the enemies of the church um, when it speaks of the of the tribulation and things of that nature, of the times we're living in, basically, um, the enemies always come from the north and the east, and so it's interesting that that they would note that was a nor'easter, you know, um, and uh, the ship is about to to wreck, it's about to sink, and Paul receives instructions from this angel, and um, what he does is he takes bread and he blesses it, he says a blessing, and then he tells these men to eat it. And so, you know, I don't know whether or not it would be um, valid. You know, I can't really say from a from a um, doctrinal point of view or a you know a uh, confirmation point of view. But they all ate the bread. That's the point. They all ate the bread, and every single person on the ship lived. Okay, and so it can be seen again allegorically. Um, personally i think they all converted i think they all converted and they all partook of the bread is which saved them i believe paul what paul said um i take that at face value it was the bread they ate that saved their lives and so anyway that's beside the point it can be seen as an allegory of the church in the end times when the when the ship is going um uh through a a, a terrible storm the enemies come from the north and the east and it is the ones who believe, the ones who believe and, and are receiving the Eucharist, okay? This is what divine mercy all has to do with, okay? Are the ones that that are that survived the shipwreck, that survived the, the time of trial and, um, and um, are, are delivered. And so, you know, I think Jesus even said this uh, in, in one of the messages to Faustina that the, that the two rays um, are to be a refuge from the wrath of his father. And, and those two rays lead to the sacred heart of Jesus, which is the Eucharist itself. It is Jesus himself. And um, it, it's just an amazing thing, again, to look at Scripture in the allegorical sense. There's so many more um, that I could go through, but I just wanted to share a couple with you just off the top of my head. Um, it, it's really, really beautiful and very, very powerful um, in the sense that Again, you have people who were writing things down hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years um, before Jesus, before Mary, um, before St. Paul. And, and the things that they chose to wrote, write down under the inspiration of the Spirit 
become become living and and again prophetic in uh, in in some cases living in prophetic allegories that point beyond themselves to things that were fulfilled in Christ or even that have yet to take place. And so again, it's just one of the most powerful things about sacred scripture is the allegorical sense. And um, again, I would highly recommend to go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church and read about the different senses of scripture. Um, you know, don't, I wouldn't say just don't open your Bible and start reading. I would really recommend that, <laughs> you know, to read your Bible. But, you know, take the time to maybe start at the beginning of the Bible and, and read about, um, you know, uh, divine revelation and the Word of God um, because there's a lot of information at the front of your Bible that is, um, you know, teachings of the church on how to read Scripture, on the different senses of Scripture, on um, symbolisms and things like that. And so... Um, I wasn't real privy to that until uh, I was. it was recommended to me um, early on uh, by a spiritual director to read that. And so, um, you know, uh, the understanding or um, how would I say, knowledge of Scripture is always a good thing, you know, and, and we never stop learning about Scripture. There is no end to it. So, as I said, these layers, you know, when you get past the second layer or the third layer and the fourth layer, um, you become it becomes very very clear that there's no end to it okay there's just so much wisdom and it's so profound and so powerful it's living as as scripture says the living word of god and um very often jesus will speak to us in our own lives through the scriptures you know if we're sincere if we're humble of heart if we're um you know truly seeking to hear him and we persevere in that prayer then very often um the Lord will will speak directly to us. And, and when that happens, you just know it. You know, um, you just know because it's, it, it, it just fits so well. Only God could do it, as I said. So anyway, this is just a number of allegories that I wanted to point out and um, kind of give you guys an idea of the allegorical sense of Scripture and how it works. Um, uh, again, it's one of the ways that I love studying Scripture. Um, but I love all the all the other senses as well. I read it, you know, in the moral sense, in the literal sense, um, in the anagogical sense, you know. But scripture to me, it's it's really um, it's it's a necessity in the Christian life. It's a necessity in the Catholic life. It is an absolute necessity that for anyone that wants to grow deeper uh, in the spiritual life and and um, uh, in, into in a more intimate relationship um, with uh, with God, with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, but it's just, again, it's just so profound um, for me. Anyway, I find it interesting. So anyway, look some of these up, and um, if you if you read the Old Testament, you're you're reading um you know the history, like I say, of the Maccabees, or you're reading um you know Abraham, or you're reading. Uh, you know um the exodus like i say um always keep at the forefront of your mind what you know about the new testament what you know about um what the church teaches about you know um the end times and, and things like that and very often these allegories will just jump right out at you and so anyway i'm going to go ahead and end this video here i i really thank you guys a lot for your prayers again i've been busy so i apologize i haven't um, posted in a while um it's just it's just an amazing time to be alive you know and so many graces happen um again thanks for the prayers for sam thanks for the prayers for me i pray for you guys every day um i will let you know about uh this um speaking engagement in chicago i will give you guys the details on that uh, if any of you guys live close and you know maybe I'll be able to, to meet some of you in person um, uh, and any priests that want to come you're more than welcome I would love your input um, and uh, in the meantime uh, pray the chapel of divine mercy every day and offer it in reparation for the sins committed by the United States you know our, our, we are in a battle for the soul of this country and um, we need to double up really really double up on prayer and so, uh, you know, this, this whole push to, to sexualize children, um, is really a, uh, 
I believe a retaliation um, for Roe v. Wade. You know, um, we knew it was there before, but the, the way it's being pushed now and the amount of young people that are involved uh, in impurity and immorality, it's, it's just, it's gone through the roof. And, and so people, we've lost our compass, you know, and, and we, re, we need to regain that, um, you know, and, and remember words like virtue and dignity and nobility, integrity, honor, um, purity, you know, they're really, really important. So um, anyways, in the meantime, again, just study the scriptures, go through them, and see if you guys can find some allegories. It's always helpful. Um, sometimes in the footnotes, you will see um, where where the uh, the scholars and the theologians and those that study within the church um, have pointed some out. Um, but again, it's a, it's a lot of fun to do and enriching. You know, it can't be bad to open the Bible and and really study with enthusiasm. And it uh, you know when you find these things, when you see them. It really, it really builds you up, you know. Um, it, it leads to the anagogical sense of scripture, right? It builds up in faith and hope, and love, and um, especially faith. You know, when when you see things like that in the scripture and realize only God could do this, um, it becomes uh, very, very obvious that everything that you're reading is is true. Um, everything you're reading happened. Um, you know things like the resurrection of Jesus take on a on a whole new elevated level um, and uh, and way of looking at it and understanding especially um, from a personal standpoint I have found anyway so anyways um, in the meantime may God bless you may he keep you may he cause his face to shine upon you and may he grant you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.